Thank you for checking out our YouTube channel. This message is for you because you matter to us. I'm Megan Brusicki, co-senior pastor of Community Church, and you're about to hear the truth of God's word in an encouraging way with practical steps to help you move forward. In fact, just by watching right now, you're on the path to living fully alive, and we wanna help you. Check out community.church to experience a service live online or to get more info, or come join us at one of our locations. We'll save you a seat. Enjoy today's message. Hey, if you're new with us today, it's so good to have you in the house. My name is Michael, I'm the senior pastor here at Community Church, and we've been in a message series where we've been talking about the reality that so many of us live our life trying to escape our moment. So many of us, if we're not careful, we live our life uh, trying to get out of you are here moments. And so we've called the, the series You Are Here and talking about, hey, don't, don't run from life. Let's, let's learn to actually live and find the life God has for us where we are now rather than always trying to get somewhere else. And so kind of to, to, to start this weekend, I wanna share a story that I read this past week in a book that I'm reading about, about three guys. And the reason I wanna share this story is because I think that all of us uh, can find ourselves, at least most of us, I, I won't say all, because there's always that one outlier. How many know what I'm saying? There's always that one person that's like, no, I, that does, that's not me, that's not me. Uh, but these three people, and, and so basically the story goes like this, and I do believe it's a true study that was done from what I understand from what I was uh, reading. But there's three guys. One guy um, basically living his life uh, neither happy nor unhappy, if you were to ask him, kind of just living his life numb, just going through life, you know, it, it is what it is, so to speak. Another guy made a decision, he said, you know what, I'm gonna, dis I I'm gonna I, I wanna kinda get my life more on track, and he said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut my diet by 125 calories per day, not a ton. He said, I'm gonna take 10 minutes every single day and I'm gonna read, and I'm gonna take 30 minutes every day and I'm gonna listen or watch something to help me grow and develop into the person I'm supposed to be. Guy number three, he, he basically was like, you know, I've been, I've been pushing, been working hard and, uh, and I just wanna enjoy life a little bit more. And so he decided he was gonna add one alcoholic drink per day to his, his uh, consumption plan. And he decided to get a new big screen TV so that he could uh, enjoy his sports more than he had been enjoying. And so they do this study, a study was done on these three guys and after five months, here's what they found. All three guys basically exactly the same, nothing different. After 12 months, they looked at the guys and basically after a year, yeah, they're all pretty much the same. At 15 months, they looked at these three guys and for all intents and purposes, uh, they, were, they were still the same but a little bit of difference, but you couldn't tell. 18 months, a little bit more change starts to show up. By 24 months, the study says, change was really noticeable, and the study stops at 31 months, and what is discovered is that at 31 months, the guy who decided to cut out 125 calories a day is now 33 pounds lighter, his marriage is better than it has ever been, and he has more joy than he's ever known. The guy who decided to add an extra alcoholic drink and get a new big screen TV for his sports is more depressed than he has ever been in his life, and has gained 33 pounds. And the guy who just went through life not happy nor unhappy, just kind of numb, well, he's exactly the same. I think all of us can find ourselves in one of those three people. I think all of us can find ourselves. I think the, the common place a lot of people live is in the first guy. We're not happy. We're not unhappy. We're just kind of going through life. We don't even give a lot of thought to our moment. We don't even get a lot of thought to our future. A lot of us maybe could find ourselves on other two tracks and often we just don't follow through on what God has. Today, I wanna talk about no matter where you might find yourself today in that moment or where you might be in the future in that moment, how God would actually speak to us right now and we could live fully alive. Would you pray with me? God, we are so grateful that right where we are today, your word says that you would encounter us, that you would meet us I thank you that you have something for us today. And I pray right now, Lord, for those that are, that, are, that are sitting at Western Branch, those that are sitting at our Suffolk campus right now, all those uh, watching online, Lord, would you speak to our hearts? I pray every one of us, Lord, we would hear exactly what we need from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of my message today is Eluding the Illusion. Eluding the illusion, the illusion that when I get there, everything will be better. 
The illusion that when that finally happens, my life will be better because the reality is when we get there, we find out there is no there there. All of us know that's true, yet we fall trapped to believing still there is this perfect, whatever it is that you might be thinking about today. And the truth is the Bible would say right now, right where we are, there is such joy in this season. Come on Suffolk campus, even right now, while we're still waiting for our permanent location to get done, there's still joy in our season. Here's what the Bible says, Philippians chapter four, it says this, be cheerful with joyous celebration in every season of life. Let joy overflow for you are united with the anointed one. That means united with Jesus, the anointed one. Every season, if you're new with us, quick recap. We're all in a season. Every one of us, we're in a season. You could say it's a good season, bad season, doesn't matter. We're all in a season right now. And the truth is, in all of our life, we're always in a season. And God says, in every season, there could be joy. Well, here's what I wanna talk about today. I believe there's two primary things that will steal our joy. Two primary things that right now, where we're living, they they will keep us from living the joy God has for our life. And this doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter uh, how long you've been following Jesus. Really, I think this is a universal truth, these two things. They are comparison and temptation. Comparison and temptation, they will rob our joy in this season. And they will continue to do it if we let them. In fact, I believe that comparison often leads us to temptation. You know, comparison's kind of a, I don't wanna say it's an easy one to talk about, but it's, but you know, we, comparison is, is really simple to define. It, it basic, comparison sucks. It's just not good. None of our lives are more enriched and better because we live a life of comparison, and yet, we know it is so hard not to live a life of comparison. You know, you know it's good to be able to kind of do some, some introspection sometimes and go, do I live a life of, of comparison? And, and there, there's good ways to check, you know. For one of the instance, one of the things you'll know if, if you're living a life of comparison, you blame other people a lot. You blame other people a lot. Because when we compare, we often actually blame the person we're comparing ourselves to for our own problems. We often feel like it's somebody else's Fault. Hey, I always, this is just this being straight, real, real honest with you right now. I always wish it was somebody else's fault than my own. Come on, who wants to be honest in church today? That would make life so much easier. No, it's all of their fault. I'm good, God. It's, that's what comparison starts to do inside of us. And it's never the way God would, would have for us, and yet it's always the temptation. And what comparison will do to us is it will cause us to be weighed down with anxiety. It'll cause us to be weighed down with stress we were never intended to carry because when we live that life, we're we're looking at somebody else's life and we're thinking maybe we should do that, maybe we should look like that, maybe we should act like that, and then we start to get stressed out. And here's the thing about this. There is no such thing as a one-to-one comparison when it comes to humanity. There is no other person that you could compare yourself to and say all aspects of our life are exactly the same, therefore this is a solid comparison. Because no matter what, there's always something different. You and I, every one of us, uniquely made on purpose, for a purpose, by God, but we're all experiencing different things at different moments, emotionally, mentally, physically. I mean, you could go down the list, it doesn't matter. Twins, identical twins, right? You can't compare because there's been different experiences that have changed the mental and emotional makeup that a person walks through. So when I compare, I'm simply looking on the outside and taking on an anxiety I don't have to. So God tells us how to get free from that anxiety. Philippians chapter four, verse six, common verse in this series. I've used it a couple times. It says this, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Love those two verses. They're true. I believe them with all of my heart. If you are anxious, pray, and God's peace will come. Here's what I found about my life, and I practice this, is that, that if, I, if I'm worked up about something, and those of you that are part of our church can imagine, I get worked up sometimes. If I'm worked up about something and I pray and I ask God for, the peace will come. But if I don't do what verse eight says, the peace will leave. 
I think the truth is that there might be some of us here today, maybe you're a Christian, and you would say, I get anxious and I pray and then I have peace, but then it's almost like immediately the peace leaves. Well, six and seven of Philippians chapter four do not stick unless I also do verse eight. In fact, one of the big dangers that we would have as Christians who would come and read the Bible is we would just pick out one verse and be like, yes, that's the truth, without actually reading it all the way through to find out what God actually says matters. See, I think if we want Philippians chapter four, verse six and seven to stick, then we have to actually live out verse eight, which says this, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. When I think this way, after I've given God my anxiety, my anxiety stays gone. But there's been plenty of times when I've been worked up about something and I prayed about it, and then after I prayed about it, I went right back to worrying about it. So I gotta, I gotta think about what I'm thinking about. I gotta start really changing the way I think. And, and how I think is, well, what you feed on is what you will think on. We were just talking last night. Isn't it interesting that, that they, they, they call in the social media, uh, well, in social media, maybe but other places, but they call it a news feed. What you feed on determines what you think on. If you look at your screen time, if you have a smart device, not as smart as you, but they call it a smart device, and you look at your screen time, what does it say you feed on? Because what you feed on will determine what you think on. It's true for every single one of us. And if I'm not feeding more on what God has for me, I'm not gonna think more on what God has for me. We've gotta bury the word, we've gotta put it inside because, because when I live that comparison route, the enemy's gonna come and bring temptation. I wanna look at an Old Testament, New Testament passage of scripture today to kinda of illustrate or under, bring some understanding of what I'm talking about. Genesis chapter three. If you're new to Bible, Genesis chapter three is, uh, is where we find Adam and Eve, the creation. God made Adam, made Eve from Adam. They're living in the Garden of Eden. It's called paradise. It's beautiful. It's perfect. Everything is amazing and great. And they told, God told Adam and Eve, hey, you can have everything in paradise except this one tree. You can't eat from it. The devil shows up disguised as a serpent. And here's what he says to them, Genesis chapter three, verse one. Did God really say? He did not come up to them and say, hey, eat of this tree, it's really good. He said, did God really tell you this? So the enemy doesn't come to tempt you and I with something we know is bad and shouldn't do. His temptation comes to you and I to get in our heads and to get us to start thinking about a decision we already made and doubting whether or not the decision we already made is the right decision. And then we start to get anxiety. And we start to wonder from this decision now that we have to make, am, did, wait, did God really say that? Because that tree, that fruit, it does look good. I mean, it looks really good. Really good. The devil didn't even have to tell them it looked good. He's like, did God really say? You know how the enemy wants to get me to doubt? He wants to get you to doubt? Did God really say that he would work all things together for your life? Did God really say stay in your marriage? Did God really say take this step of faith? And then we go, I don't, I don't know. And what happens is, see, we live a life of decision. How many know we live a life making a lot of decisions? Leaders often, they will get, uh, they will get stressed out, overwhelmed, sick, if you will, emotionally, because of this thing called decision fatigue. Because they just make so many decisions. And they just, I mean, they wear you out. I don't have to work on that because so many decisions. And, and let's be honest, needing to make decisions stresses us out. Let's be honest right now. It's morning service, Suffolk and Western Branch. Some of you today, your greatest stressed decision you will make today is where you eat lunch. <laughs> you will be stressed out about it. And then after you eat lunch, you will start to think about dinner and you will start to get stressed out about this decision you have to make, 
You know, I wonder if we looked at the amount of time we spend thinking about decisions, if we get more stressed out thinking about and trying to decide what we're gonna eat than we do anything else. Which is why Jesus said, don't worry about that stuff. Because the enemy tries to get us distracted to decide things, what God said they aren't that important. Decision fatigue. So the enemy's temptation comes to you and I to try to get us to doubt decisions we've already made. So we gotta feed on his word. Well, here's what he did to Jesus in Matthew chapter four. Matthew chapter four, verse one through 11, maybe one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible. It says this, Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Jesus was led by God himself, Holy Spirit, into the wilderness. What is the wilderness? The wilderness is the place of barrenness. The wilderness is the place where you don't have air conditioning. The wilderness is the place where most of us don't raise our hands and go, this is where I want to go. And yet, this is the place where God led himself to so that he could face temptation. Do you know what I like to run from? Wilderness. I like to run from difficult circumstances. I like to run from moments that I'm just like, this is gonna be tough. And yet God will lead us into the wilderness, it says. Because he has some things to teach us about ourselves. He has some things to teach us about him. So he shows us this example of what's gonna happen in the wilderness, if we'll let him. It says this in verse two. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. The only thing worse about being in the wilderness is when you're in the wilderness with no food. Verse three, it says, during that time, the devil came to him, the devil came to Jesus, and he said this, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. He tempted him not to try to get him to do something first, he tempted tempted him about his identity. Are you, if you are the son of God, if you really are who you say you are, he speaks into his identity to try to cause Jesus himself to doubt, because the enemy knows if he can get us questioning our identity, he can get us questioning everything we do. Because we worry so much about what we're supposed to do, but when we know who we are, we'll know what to do. As if you are the son of God, command these stones. But Jesus told him, Jesus had a response. No, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Verse five, then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple. And he said, if you are the son of God, jump off for the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdom, kingdoms of the world and their glory. He said, I will give it all to you if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus said, for the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. The devil comes to tempt, and I don't know about you, but once I get victory from something in my life, like I feel like I, feel like I had a struggle and I get victory from it, I wanna be done and not have to face another one. How many of you wanna be honest in church and go, that's what I want? And here's the problem with Matthew chapter four. What we just learned is the devil came to him and said, if you are, do this. And Jesus, he's God, he's like, no. He tells the devil, no. Some of us should start telling the devil, no, a whole lot more. It would help our life a whole lot. He tells the devil, no. And so you're like, okay, now I can rest. And then the devil comes right back and goes, if you are, Wait, I already said this. Do I have to go through this again? Yes, because this isn't heaven. But the power is when I know in here what God's word says. When I live a Philippians 4, 8 life where I'm thinking about the promise and the truth of God because to everything the enemy said, Jesus had a response which was the truth of God's word. Jesus actually puts himself in a place just like you and I because his response is not something supernatural that only he could do. His response is simply quoting back the truth of God. You and I can do that. Nothing holds you and I back from that. The word of God is alive. The word of God has power. That's why I gotta feed on it. So I gotta think on it, because then I have power when the enemy attacks. We shouldn't despise the wilderness, and I think the reason we shouldn't despise the wilderness is because of this, now that I'm through my introduction and can give you my first point. (laughs) 
In the wilderness, we discover ourselves. In the wilderness, we discover ourselves. Most people, we don't like to actually discover ourselves because it takes work and because it's painful. Wow, I'm glad I came to church today. <laughs> and so we live our life like guy one from my example. Not really happy, not really unhappy, just kind of going through. Not doing the work of discovering who, who am I? What is my struggle? What would God do with my life right now? How would he shape my life? How would he change me right now? What do, I, what do I need to work on in my life right now so that I could even recognize the way the enemy attacks? H Author Henry Nouwen says that in this passage of scripture that, that really that there's a pattern or three things uh, that, that the enemy tempts Jesus with and there are three temptations that all of us still face today. The first one, he says, is the temptation to be self-sufficient. The temptation to be self-sufficient. That's how he'll tempt us, that we don't need people, that we don't need God, that we are supposed to just be able to figure it out on our own. He tells Jesus, why don't you tell these stones to become bread? Why don't you just prove that you can create whatever you need in this moment and don't need anybody's help? That's how the enemy tries to tempt me. That's how he tries to tempt you. You can just make it on your own. Such a desire that this culture would tell me that if I wanna live fully alive, then I have to be able to do it on my own. But the truth is God made us to need relationship with each other and to need relationship with him, which is why the enemy says, if I can get them to think they don't need people and they don't need God, they will be lost. And yet people might tell us, you're doing great. But self-sufficiency isn't God's answer for any of our lives. Dependence on God and life-giving, God-centered relationships. So if you're not in a small group, get in a small group right now. I mean, after service. It's so important. I don't think anybody was going to right now, but I just had the thought. If you were like, okay, right now, no, after service. Like, like sign up and, and go, go join a group. They started a couple weeks ago, but you can still jump in a small group. Like, get in relationship with other people that, that you know they're running the same direction. They don't have it figured out but we just wanna run the same direction. We want what God wants for our life. We don't, we don't wanna be more influenced. We don't wanna feed more on all these other things. We wanna feed more on what God says. The second thing he says is a way that, that we're really attempted is the temptation to be spectacular. The temptation to be spectacular. He says, if you are the son of God, jump off. Do you know in 2019, I can say that I don't think there's been a time in Western history when there's been more of a temptation to be spectacular. You can become famous and spectacular today in 30 seconds. I read a study recently that said, <laughs> this is gonna make you laugh, more than half, more than half of people under the age of 30 think a movie should be made about them. The people that are shaking their heads and laughing at Western Branch were the over 30 crowd. <laughs> but do you know why? Because this, the younger generation, those of you under 30, you've, you've, you're, you've grown up in this world where you're, you see people that are spectacular, like I'm as cool as they are. I could make billions of dollars making YouTube videos just that same way. And so what happens inside is we get distracted from what God has for our life. And we start to try to think about how could I come, become an overnight success? How could everything change in a moment? Instead of thinking like guy number two, who goes, I'm gonna cut out 125 calories per day. And after five months had no change. How do you know that's not encouraging? <laughs> Most of us quit. Which is why the enemy's temptation for overnight success and being spectacular and being whatever sounds so appealing to us. And that's why we have to have God's word buried in here because you know how Jesus responded every time to the devil? 
He told the temptation the truth. We've gotta tell the temptation the truth if we wanna make it lose its power over our life. We, we tell the, when that thought comes in, and this is why I tell, this, I tell you this all the time, when you gotta speak, we've gotta speak God's word out of our mouth because the most important words we hear are the words that come out of our own mouths. This has to be your own faith. I'm glad that you're at church. I'm glad that you're watching online. I believe you can be encouraged. I believe being together in church is so vital and a must if we're gonna live fully alive. But our faith will sustain us, not because we go to church. Our faith will sustain us because of our relationship with Jesus Monday through Saturday. And if we feed on his word, and if we grow in relationship with him, Listen, this isn't, this isn't sexy to talk about, but, but listen, this whole temptation to be spectacular, we need to understand something. We all have limits. We all have limits. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, around verse 4 or 5 or 3, <laughs> I know it's in there, <laughs> says that... <laughs> You can go read it, I promise. <laughs> it says God has, has, by his divine power, if you're a follower of Jesus, it says by God's divine power, he has given you, you as an individual, everything you need, you as an individual, me as an individual, he's given us everything we need by his divine power so that we can escape the corruption in the world that is caused by evil desires. Now here's what I want you to understand. Just like there's no one-to-one -one comparison, when God's divine power comes into my life and God's divine power comes into your life, there is like this marrying together, if you will. You are a person, you have a soul, you have a spirit, you're a created being by God. So when his power is in you and matches with you, you're still unique. Listen, we all have limits. And here's what I mean. One of the worst things we do as parents, this is my opinion, if you disagree, that's all right. But I think I'm right, but it's just opinion is tell our kids they can be whatever they wanna be. My kids can't, can't be whatever they wanna be. If my kids wanna live fully alive, they need to be what God created them to be. That's the difference. And the devil tries to come and tempt you to be something you were never supposed to be, which is why we have anxiety, which is why we're stressed out which is why if we change the way we think, it'll change everything. Just measure, measure your mouth, measure your words. Think about it like this. What you think on, you will speak on. Do you like your words? If you don't like your words, change what you think on. If you don't like what you speak on, you gotta change what you think on. If you wanna change what you think on, you gotta change what you feed on. I'll simplify it for you. Feed, think, speak. What do you feed on? What do you stay the course on? In John chapter six, it's this great passage of scripture where Jesus, you know it's a good passage of scripture when I say that because I tell you if I don't like the scripture, just so that if you're new, if you ever wondered, just thought, random thoughts by Pastor Michael. In John chapter six, Jesus is talking about uh, he, he's just kind of teaching. That is what Jesus did. But he's teaching about life and food. In John chapter six, he says these words. He says, man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now I wanna go back to something I said earlier. If you think about your decisions, do you make more decisions and are you more stressed and do you give more attention to decisions about what you're gonna eat than you do about your relationship with Jesus? And this is the reason we're stressed. And this is the reason we have anxiety. Listen, feel and, and hear me. If you're here today and you're like, man, I compare everything. Yeah, it's a fight. Feel no condemnation. The scriptures say in Romans chapter eight, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm telling you this today because I could stand up here today and I could say, you know what, it'll steal your joy and, and I could talk about like, there's, there's, there's how, how, to, how to do better at work and how to do better in your family and how to do better with your finances and 
do better in relationships and all those are important things and I will teach about all those things. But the truth is, is that comparison and temptation, they are the root in all of those things. They're the root to all of those things. And so when you look at your life today, when you look at your life this morning and and think about it, how are you living with a lot of comparison and a lot of temptation? Find yourself frustrated and stressed out because you saw what somebody else had or did? And we think about that from a material perspective. It doesn't, it can be in anything. I should be there by now. Listen, if you're breathing, God's not done with you. The third way that Henry Nouwen says we're tempted in that passage of scripture is the temptation to be powerful. He tells Jesus, Satan does in Matthew chapter four, hey, I will give you all this because God, Father God had given Satan, he's given him authority on the earth until the time Jesus will return one day. He doesn't have more authority than God, but he gave him a level on on the earth. And he says, hey, Jesus, you can have all of this. You can be powerful. He who has the most is the most powerful, says our world. So I start to think if I just get more, I just get more. And listen, you will never, ever, ever, ever hear me say God doesn't want to bless your life. That God doesn't want to give you more. I do believe there's more, and I do believe God wants to bless your life and give you more, but not if you think more makes you powerful. I think He'll withhold from us if He thinks getting more will make us powerful. Because the only way we can actually live is when we understand He's the one with the power. If I will live with like this surrendered position of my heart and my life to say, I'm just. He- I'm just happy to, I'm just, listen, I'm just happy God forgave me. To be completely honest with you this morning, like Megan and I are praying this morning uh, before church and before the kids got up. Come on, that's the only time you gotta get up at 2 a.m. for that, but you know, not really that early. But, but we're praying together this morning and I'm just like, thank you. Just having that feeling inside, like, thank you, Lord, you already went before me. The Bible says he's already, he, Everything that is in my future, God has already gone and made a way. He's literally just asking me to say yes. He's asking me and you to stay the course. Those little decisions and things that you maybe have started in your life. He's saying, keep going. Keep don't don't quit because you don't see it all right now. Maybe you're here today and you're like, I had made some changes in the past, but but the truth is I haven't really been following them at all. Maybe the day's your time to be like, no, I there's some changes I need to make. It's time, it's time to really start doing those. It, maybe it is to, to, to start a relationship with Jesus. Maybe it is to get baptized. Maybe it is, maybe it is to pray. Maybe it is to read your Bible. And you're like, I did it for six months. Well, have you done it for three years every single day? Because if you do, your life will be better. If you do your money God's way, in five months, it may not look any different, but I guarantee you over time it will. This weekend, I heard another story this morning. This weekend, I have literally heard four stories of people who decided to tithe, and over a period of time, it has totally changed their life. Stay the course. Whatever it is for you, stay the course. God is faithful. He's better than me and you. He's better than me and you. And if it hasn't worked in the past because of your own failure, he forgives us and says, hey, today's a day for a fresh start. Would you close your eyes with me today? God, I thank you so much that you're faithful and that you're good. I thank you, Lord, that you don't, you don't condemn us. Because God, I can stand before you right now and I believe that that maybe there's a few hundred people, if they were honest, Lord, right now in this service, in this moment, would be the same, that, that God, I struggle sometimes with comparison. That God, I can, I can sense sometimes temptation that would pull me away from your plan for my life. God, and for those of us that would say today, that's me, I'm asking you right now, Holy Spirit, would you awaken us fresh today? 
to your divine power that has given us everything we need to escape not my moment, but to escape the corruption that would try to ruin my life. Thank you that you speak to us, God. If you're here today and if you are honest with yourself, you know the truth is that, that you simply have not really made the decision to follow Jesus. You've, you've gone through life and maybe you've even been in church, but if, if I saw you on Tuesday, there would be nothing about your life that would cause people to think you're a Christian because it's a just check the box thing. And you'd say, you know, I wanna change that. I want my life to change. I, I wanna change priorities. I wanna become more intentional than I ever have been to walk step by step with God and what he has for my life. If that's you, I'm gonna pray a prayer and I wanna ask you to pray it with me. And if you're already a follower of Jesus, committing to not be perfect at all, but just committing to follow him and, and live your life in obedience as best we can to what he would say, then pray it with me as well because we pray together. Say, Jesus, thank you for loving me. Today, I've decided I trust you. I believe you're for me, not against me. And from now on, I will seek you above all else. Forgive me for running the wrong way. Today I'm running back to you. In Jesus' name, amen.